welcome. On behalf of the National Transit Institute, I thank you for, for participating in the NTD 2018 Report Year Changes webinar. The National Transit Institute develops, promotes, and delivers training and education programs for the public transit industry in the United States. We are pleased to have as our presenters today Brittany Starlings and Matt Oliver. Brittany Starlings joined the NTD team in 2015. She is a graduate of McDaniel College and currently serves as the Validation Manager for the National Transit Database Urban Reporting Module. Matt Oliver joined the NTD team in 2008. He is a graduate of the University of Virginia and currently serves as the Operations Manager for the NTD Validation Team. I will now turn the presentation over to Matt. Good afternoon or morning for those in Pacific Time or earlier. Welcome to the 2018 Report Your Changes webinar. Our presentation today will focus on changes to the annual NTD reporting policy and resulting changes to the online reporting tool. Much of this presentation will apply to all reporter types, including full, reduced, state DOTs and their subrecipients, and reduced asset reporters. We will note when a change applies to a specific type. On Tuesday, FTA opened the database for reporting. If your agency has completed its fiscal year 2018, you may now begin reporting your FY 2018 data to the NTD. Earlier this summer, FTA released its 2018 Annual Policy Manual along with other resources. Reporting deadlines are covered on page 13 of the 2018 Policy Manual. If your agency's fiscal year ends on June 30th or sooner, your NTD report is due by October 31st. If your fiscal year ends, falls between July 1st and September 30th, your report is due January 31st, 2019. And if your fiscal year ends on October 1st or later in 2018, your report is due April 30th, 2019. While this presentation will not be delivered again during this report year, FTA will publish the recording and link it from the NTD program website, transit.dot.gov slash NTD. This webinar will review the following topics. The expanded asset inventory module, the changes to the annual forms that were a result of the most recently published uniform system of accounts. We will go over the updated requirements for the independent auditor statement financial data. We will discuss the differences between commuter and intercity service. We will review the updated definition for mechanical failures. And finally, we will go over the reporting requirements for JARC-only beneficiaries. Your instructors today will be myself, Matt Oliver, and Brittany Starlings. Together we lead a team of 13 validation analysts that validate and close out NTD reports for close to 1,000 agencies. If you have any questions at the conclusion of the webinar, please do not hesitate to contact us or your agency's analysts for assistance. Here you will find contact information for other NTD program management stakeholders, a few of which are joining us today. The expanded asset inventory module is the first of the two biggest changes that the agencies will encounter with the 2018 annual report. During the prior report year, these forms were visible to the agencies and the agencies were not required to complete. 2018 will be the first report year where these forms and fields are mandatory. One of the most important terms you will encounter with the expanded asset inventory module is capital responsibility. An agency has capital responsibility for an asset if they either one, own the asset, two, jointly own the asset, or three, are responsible for replacing, overhauling, refurbishing, or conducting major repairs on an asset. It is important to note that performing routine maintenance, such as oil changes and tire rotations, does not alone qualify as capital responsibility. Additionally, most leases that agencies are familiar with, whether it is a true lease, a lease from related parties, or capital leasing, does not qualify as capital responsibility. So how does capital responsibility play into this? For this new expanded asset module, agencies are responsible for providing condition assessments only for those assets for which they have capital responsibility. With this expanded module, new forms were created and new fields were added to existing forms. The two existing forms with new fields this year are the A30 Revenue Vehicle Inventory Form and the A20 Transitway Mileage Form. 
We will begin with the A30 form. As you might be aware, you will have one A30 for each mode and type of service that you report. The first new field is the Useful Life Benchmark, or ULB. This is the expected life in years of a capital asset within an agency's unique operating environment. FTA has established default ULBs based on the vehicle type. However, agencies may choose their own Useful Life Benchmark. If an agency uses a Useful Life Benchmark that differs from FTA's default ULB, the validation analyst may inquire about this during validation. The next new field is Useful Life Remaining. This is an auto-calculated field based on the year of manufacturer and the Useful Life Benchmark for that specific fleet. This field identifies the number of years remaining in that fleet's life cycle. There is a new checkbox where an agency may indicate if they have no capital responsibility. Checking this box would remove the ULB fields since the agency would not be required to complete that field if they do not have capital responsibility for that particular asset. The last new field on this form is a type of last renewal field. If an agency identifies a year of rebuild for a fleet, they should then use this type of last renewal drop-down to identify what type of rebuild it was. The options listed are 1. Midlife powertrain, 2. Midlife overhaul, or 3. Life extending overhaul. If you perform a life extending overhaul, you may want to revisit the useful life benchmark since the rebuild has extended the life of the asset. The second of the two existing forms that have gained new fields is the A20 form. Agencies will have one A20 form that covers all of their fixed guideway modes. Keep in mind, this form is only for fixed guideway, so if you do not have fixed guideway, this form will not appear in your report package. The top section of this form that covers non-rail fixed guideway, such as motor bus, commuter bus, and bus rapid transit, will remain the same. However, for rail fixed guideway, the bottom of the form has changed. There are three new sections, guideway, power and signal, and track. The first of these two sections have two parts, basic and construction. The third section, track, has one part, basic. Starting with the guideway section, you can see the breakout between the two parts, basic and construction. For the basic information, the agency will identify how many miles, linear track miles, they have for each applicable guideway type. The agency will also identify how many years the track is expected to last when new, the percent capital responsibility the agency has for the track, and if applicable, the agency with whom they share capital responsibility. For the construction side of things, the agency will group the guideway into buckets based on the year the guideway was built. We mentioned in the previous slide that an agency will identify how many miles they have for each guideway type using either linear or track miles. The difference between those two options is illustrated here. Linear miles are the length of the route path, no matter how many railways you have going over that same path. Track miles are the cumulative length of all track going over that path. The example shown here is an agency that has three tracks going over the same one mile path. This would be one linear mile, but three track miles. The agency may choose which of the two options they wish to use to report on the A20 form. This slide shows screenshots that represent the two parts of the guideway section. On the left, you can see the guideway types listed by row. If the agency does not have a specific guideway type, check the NA box to the right of that guideway element and ignore the rest of the row. On the right, you can see the same guideway elements by row, and then age buckets across the top. The agency will select the allocation unit from the drop-down menu, selecting either track miles, linear miles, or percentage. The agency will then identify how much of their total was constructed in each of these decade-long age buckets. Guideway was the first of the three new sections on the A20 form. The next is power and signal, broken out into the same two parts, basic and construction. The data are similar to the guideway section, but instead of reporting the data for the miles of guideway, agencies will report a count of their substations and whether or not they have any of the additional power and signal elements, such as third rail or overhead power distribution. Here we have a screenshot, we have screenshots of the power and signal section. The same logic applies to this section, where if the agency does not have a specific type of power and signal element, they should use the NA checkbox and ignore the rest of the row. 
The last of the three new sections is the track section. The first part of the track section identifies the type of track. The second part of the track section identifies special track elements such as grade crossings and turnouts. We will start with the type of track. The first two rows identify tangent and curve track on which you operate revenue service. These two lines include all revenue service track, whether or not the agency has capital responsibility. The next row identifies any non-revenue service track. This includes side or yard track. The last of the four rows identifies the portion of the tangent and curve revenue track for which the agency does not have capital responsibility. This last line should be a subset of the first two lines. For each of these rows, the agency will report the following. Total track miles, expected service when new, percent capital responsibility, and if applicable, the other entity with whom they share capital responsibility. At the bottom of the track section, the agency will identify the miles of track under performance restriction. This field is the condition assessment used for track. A performance restriction exists when the agency cannot operate at full speed over a specific segment of track. For this field, the agency should only account for the track for which they have capital responsibility. Here is a screenshot of the track section of the A20 form. As a review, lines 15 and 16, the tangent and curve track, should include all revenue track no matter the capital responsibility. Line 17, the non-revenue track, should be all yard and side track. The last line, 18, should identify the portion of revenue track with no capital responsibility. This cannot be greater than the total of lines 15 and 16 since this is a subset of your total revenue track. At the bottom of this section, there's a field for the total track miles under performance restriction. These are the miles of revenue track that an agency has capital responsibility for but cannot operate at maximum speed. These would be considered your slow zones. When the A90 form, which we will go over later in this presentation, calculates the performance measure for the agency's track, the form will calculate the portion of your revenue track miles that you have capital, resp capital responsibility for and are considered slow zones. For further information on how to calculate track under performance restrictions, please refer to the FTA guidebooks posted on our website. The second part of the track section identifies the special track elements such as crossovers, turnouts, and crossings. The agencies will report the following. Account of these elements, the expected service when new, the percent capital responsibility, and if applicable, the entity with whom the agency shares capital responsibility. Here's a, here's a screenshot of the special elements section. Again, the agency can check the NA box if they do not have that specific element and ignore the rest of the row. We will now take a look at the three new forms that came about with the expanded asset inventory module. The A15, Transit Asset Management Facilities Inventory, which reviews the facilities. The A35, Service Vehicle Inventory, which reviews the service or non-revenue vehicles. And the A90, Transit Asset Management Performance Measure Targets, which captures the performance targets. Starting with the A15 form, agencies should report administrative and maintenance facilities as well as passenger facilities used in revenue service. Agencies will have one A15 form that captures all modes and types of service. For administrative and maintenance facilities, the agency should report only the facilities for which they have capital responsibility. Examples of these would be general purpose maintenance facilities and revenue collection facilities. For passenger facilities, the agency should report all passenger facilities used in revenue service, whether they have capital responsibility or not. Agencies are required to inventory all of the, passengers facil all of the passenger facilities. However, they are only required to report condition assessments for the facilities for which they have capital responsibility. Examples of passenger facilities would be parking structures for passengers, stations, and bus transfer centers. Here's a screenshot of the A15 form. You will see that it has three sections. The first field is for the name of the facility. The agency is free to name the facility whatever they would like, and this name will carry over to the other sections of this form. The agency will select a primary mode. This is similar to the concept of predominant use used for reporting capital expenditures. 
If this facility serves more than one mode, the agency should choose a primary mode. And then in the next field, they can identify any other mode served as a secondary mode. The secondary mode field is not a drop-down menu, so agencies will need to start typing before options appear. Agencies can also identify any private modes that share use of that facility. The options for these non-public transit modes are airport, private bus, private water transit, and private rail. An example of private bus would be Greyhound, an example of a private rail would be Amtrak. The other details agencies will report are facility type, year built, square footage, parking spaces, which only need to be filled out for parking facilities, agency capital responsibility, the condition assessment, and the address. The next new form is the A35 form. This captures all non-revenue vehicles for which the agency has capital responsibility. Examples of these would be cars used for administrative staff, tow trucks, and service trucks. Agencies will have one of these forms to capture all of their modes and types of service. Here we have the screenshot of the A35 form broken out into two sections. Similar to the A15, it starts with naming the fleet and if the agency chooses to do so, reporting the agency fleet ID. The agency fleet ID, which is an optional field, was intended to help agencies match the system assigned ID number to their own agency fleet records. The notes section is also an optional field where agencies can include any necessary information about a fleet. Similar to the facilities, the agency is required to assign a primary mode. It can assign secondary modes as applicable. The primary mode selection is at the agency's discretion. The agency will select the vehicle type from a drop-down menu. The options include automobiles, truck and other rubber tire vehicles, and steel wheel vehicles. The vehicle type determines the idle populated useful life benchmark. However, the agency can change the idle populated value to match their own internal ULB if different from FTA's default. Agencies report the total vehicles in this fleet, keeping in mind that you can group non-revenue vehicles similar to how you can group revenue vehicles on the A30 form. If all vehicle characteristics are identical, they can be grouped into one line. The second section of this form captures percent capital responsibility, estimated cost, and the year dollars associated with that cost. For the estimated cost, the agency should report the full cost to replace the fleet, including soft costs such as financing charges. This value can be the most recent value the agency has, whether that is the original cost of the asset or the insured value. The year dollars of the estimated cost is the year your estimate is from. If you are using the original cost of the asset and it was purchased in 2012, your year dollars would be 2012. The last of the new forms is the A90 form. This form will be required for agencies that have their own transit asset management plan or any agencies that are sponsoring a group transit as asset management plan. Agencies that are participating in a group TAM plan will not be required to complete this form. On this form, agencies will report the portion of their assets that they hope to have met or exceeded the condition assessment for the upcoming fiscal year. The following year, the form will pull in actual performance based on the data reported in the asset forms and compare them to the targets set in the prior year. Agencies will then repeat the process and establish new targets for the next year. At the bottom of the form, there's a section for a narrative report. This will be a document outlining the performance targets and progress towards those targets. The narrative report is not required until report year 2019. This is a screenshot of the A90 form. Following the same logic as the other asset forms, if a particular line item does not apply to the agency, click NA with NA checkbox at the far right and ignore the rest of the row. Again, this is not required until report year 2019, but if you will be submitting a narrative report this year, the upload button is shown here for your reference. Wrapping up the expanded asset inventory module section, we want to identify some resource, resources for agencies to use going forward. The Transit Asset Management, or TAM, webpage can be found at the top of this page. The TAM page has several helpful tools for agencies a frequently asked questions resource, a list of the regional contacts 
for TAM related questions, and links to past webinars and trainings and more information on the TAM plan requirements. Additionally, on the NTD webpage, there is a section for the asset inventory module. This section includes a reporting guide for how to complete the asset forms, condition assessment guidebooks, general form templates, and links to additional webinars and presentations. The updated USOA is the second of the two biggest changes that agencies will encounter in the 2018 annual report. Over the next few slides, we will highlight the differences between the 2017 and 2018 form. The first slide here illustrates the changes in reporting for fair revenues. The top screenshots show full reporters and the bottom shows reduced reporters. Passenger fares were previously only broken out by mode and type of service. However, in 2018, fares will be further broken out into passenger paid and organization paid fares. Passenger paid fares are fairly simple. These would be any time a passenger paid money to ride the vehicle. Organization paid fares would be any time someone other than the passenger paid for that trip. Organization paid fares include special route guarantees as well as reduced fare reimbursement. Additionally, for full reporters, the form is slightly reorganized. Now you only report fares earned and the amount of fares that you expended are reported as a part of the total directly generated funds expended on operations or capital. Most of the changes to the directly generated funds section of the F10 form are cosmetic formatting changes. Some fields were renamed but capture the same funding. We removed the other directly generated funds line and added two new fields, extraordinary and special items, and total recoveries. Other transportation revenues is now labeled non-public transportation revenues, but still captures the same items. These would be charter, school bus, and freight revenues. Non-transportation funds has been renamed to other agency revenues, but again still captures the same funding. That field would capture items such as interest income, rental income, and the sale of maintenance services, fuel, and assets. The first of the two new fields in this section is extraordinary and special items. Extraordinary items would be occurrences that are unusual and infrequent, meaning unrelated to normal transit operations and not likely to occur again. Special items are either unusual or infrequent, but not both. One example of this would be a blizzard that shuts down transit operations for multiple days. This could be reported as an extraordinary and special item. The second of the two new fields in this section is total recoveries. This field captures the proceeds recovered for damages. In prior years, these proceeds were netted against casualty and liability costs on the operating expense form. Going forward, they are to be reported as revenues. Non-added revenues is a new subsection of the F10 form, made up of one field previously reported as well as three new fields. Contributed services existed on prior year forms. However, we have added voluntary non-exchange transactions, sale and disposal of assets, and transportation development credits. We will discuss each of these in further detail next. Voluntary non-exchange transactions is one of the new fields on the F10 form. Agencies would use this field to report an instance where they received an asset without giving equal value. An example of this would be if one agency built a rail mode and then gifted it to another agency. The receiving agency would report the value of the asset as earned on this line of the F10 form. On the other side of the example, the provider of the asset would use the voluntary non-exchange transaction line but the one on the F40 form as a reconciling item. Disposal of assets is another new field. Previously, agencies would report proceeds from selling assets as other directly generated funds. However, that field was removed. Going forward, any amount received up to the book value is reported here as sale and disposal of assets. If the agency receives more than the book value, the additional amount gets reported as other agency funds. If the asset is fully depreciated, the entire amount received would be reported as other agency funds. Transportation Development Credits, also known as TDCs or Toll Credits, is a new field in Report Year 2018. 
Previously, if an agency used toll credits as matching funds, there was nowhere to report this, so they were omitted from the report. Going forward, agencies should report the value on the transportation development credits line. However, this amount is not included in total operating expenses because it was not actually an amount received and expended. The local government section of the finance form remains the same. However, the state government section has been greatly consolidated, as seen here. Going forward, state government funds are either general funds or state transportation funds. Essentially, if the original source of funding is not a transportation fund or dedicated to transit, then it is general funding. There is also no longer an other line item. The F30 form for operating expenses is a full reporter only form. The form shows many formatting changes. One cost function was renamed and one new field was added. However, only a few policy changes occurred. The non-vehicle maintenance cost function, shown as a column heading on the F30 form, was renamed to facility maintenance with the acronym FM. Paid absences is a new field added to the F30 form. Previously, paid absences were included in fringe benefits. There is still a fringe benefits line item, however, now paid time off, or PTO, should be broken out of fringe benefits and reported separately. Similar to salaries and fringe benefits, the paid absences are broken out by operator and non-operator. One of the policy changes that occurred was surrounding the treatment of tax refunds. Previously, these tax refunds were reported as revenue and the agencies would report the full cost of operation. Going forward, agencies should net the refund from the cost. For example, if an agency spent $120, $20 of which was fuel taxes that they were later reimbursed for, in previous years they would have reported $20 of tax refund revenue and $20 spent on tax. Now they will only report the $100 spent on fuel because the $20 refund nets out the $20 tax expense. Another policy change is the treatment of, ad of advertising fees. In prior years, the cost paid to develop ad materials was considered services, but the purchase of ad space, such as TV or radio time, was considered a miscellaneous cost. Going forward, both the development of materials and the ad space is reported as services. The last of the policy changes for the F30 form surrounds casualty and liability costs. Previously, agencies could split their insurance expense across three cost functions, those being vehicle maintenance, non-vehicle maintenance, and general administration. Going forward, agencies should lump all insurance costs under general administration. There were several changes made to the F40 form, which is also only a full reporter form. We renamed two lines and added two others. Leases and rentals was renamed operating lease expenses. This field should include the same items as in prior years, those being equipment, property, and capital leases, where the agency does not have or acquire ownership of the asset. For example, leasing a copier or leasing a vehicle. Purchase lease agreement was renamed capital lease. This field still captures the agreement where agencies routinely pay a lease amount. However, at the end of the lease agreement, the agency owns or has the option to purchase the asset. The two new fields on this form were discussed in prior slides as well. Those fields are the voluntary non-exchange transactions and extraordinary and special items. The voluntary non-exchange transaction field on the F40 form would capture the provider of the asset giving that asset to another entity without receiving equal value as mentioned earlier. The extraordinary and special items field on the F40 would capture funds expended for these unusual and infrequent occurrences unrelated to normal transit operations. The F60 form, another full reporter form, was completely redone. This form now more closely resembles a balance sheet that accountants are familiar with. The screenshots here are both from the 2018 version of the form, which encompasses much more than in prior years. One major change to the form is the inclusion of capital assets. Previously, agencies were directed to exclude capital assets from the F60 form, but starting in report year 2018, there is a line specifically for those assets. 
Another major change is a new field called net position. This is an auto-calculated field that determines the difference between the agency's assets and liabilities. The B30 contractual relationship form also received some updates. There is a new field in the contract summary section labeled fares retained by. This field should identify whether the seller keeps the fares or the seller returns the fares collected to the buyer. There is also new functionality. Instead of entering values directly into the grid at the bottom of the form, there is an edit button at the far right for each mode and type of service on that contract. Upon clicking that edit button, the form will bring you to a page that looks like this, where agencies can enter the contract-related details. The logic of this form has been modified. Previously, agencies were to subtract the fares and capital leasing from the total payment to the contractor and type in a net figure. Going forward, agencies will still report the fares and capital leasing amounts as they used to, but instead of netting them, they now type in the total payment to the contractor in the direct payment line and the form will calculate the rest of the necessary data. The B30 for van pool modes will look slightly different than the other, than the form looks for other modes. There are two new fields. The first new field is passenger out-of-pocket expenses, which will capture all costs paid for by the passengers directly, such as fuel, tolls, and maintenance. The second new field is agency subsidy, which will be the amount paid by the transit agency to the van pool contractor. This often takes the form of a per van, per month subsidy. Lastly, the R10 resources form was updated as a result of the new USOA. Similar to previous years, the form will be separated into full-time and part-time employees, but it is now further broken down into operators and non-operators to more closely mimic the F30 salaries, paid absences, and fringe benefits breakout. Wrapping up the USOA section, we again have resources shown here for agencies to refer to after the webinar. The published USOA can be found at the provided link. Each funding source and expense type in the USOA has a corresponding four-digit number that can be found on the NTE forms themselves. If you have questions about where to report something or what a certain line should capture, you can look up the four-digit number in the USOA document for more details. Additionally, there is a webinar posted to the NTD webpage where FTA discussed these changes in a bit more detail in regards to the Federal Register Notice. The next change we will discuss is the Independent Auditor Statement for Financial Data, also known as the IASFD. This audit is a review of the agency's accounting system to determine whether or not the agency can meet NTD financial reporting requirements. The auditor should determine whether the agency's chart of accounts mirrors or is directly translatable to the USOA. In prior years, this audit was only applicable to full reporters and separate service reporters. Going forward, this audit requirement now applies to reduced reporters or small system reporters. Tribes and rural subrecipients are excluded from this requirement. This audit was previously only required for the first year an agency reported to the National Transit Database or if the agency significantly changed their accounting system. Now the requirement states that agencies must perform this audit every 10 years. This means that if your agency has never completed an IASFD audit or has not completed the audit in the past 10 years, you are required to submit an IASFD audit with your 2018 report. In terms of resources, the policy manual appendix contains a template for the auditor statement. However, auditors do not have to use this template. It is just a helpful tool. Additionally, FTA has published an IASFD help sheet to clarify the intent of the IASFD and suggestions for what the auditor should be reviewing. This help sheet can be found on the NTD webpage under the manual section of reference materials. Next, we will go over a clarification regarding the, the determination of commuter service. FTA considers commuter service to be local service. This means that 50% or more of the passengers boarding at each key stop must make a return trip that same day. If that 50% return trip rate is not met, the service is considered inner city service as opposed to commuter service. This is important because inner city service is not attributable to an urbanized area or UZA. 
In terms of NTD reporting, FTA has clarified that new commuter and ferry services with a maximum one-way trip time exceeding 90 minutes will need to perform a year-long survey to demonstrate that their service meets the 50% or more same-day return trip rate in order to qualify as commuter service. If an agency has not completed the full 12-month sample by the time the annual report is submitted, they should allocate the service to the non-UZA until they can complete the survey and are able to demonstrate the minimum 50% same-day return trips. FTA updated the definition of mechanical failures to provide clarity. Similar to prior years, a mechanical failure is when a revenue vehicle does not complete its scheduled trip or does not start its next scheduled trip. The definition was updated to clarify that disruptions caused by traffic collisions, natural disasters, and vandalism do not qualify as mechanical failures. Lastly, FTA clarified reporting requirements for JARC-only beneficiaries. Typically, the understanding has been that an agency that receives 5307 or 5311 funding must report to the NTD. However, FTA clarified that if an agency received those funds for job access reverse commute, reverse commute or JARC projects and does not provide public transportation, then that agency is not required to report to the NTD. Thank you for taking the time today to participate in the webinar. We will now turn the webinar over to Lori. Hi, everyone. Um, are there any more questions? If so, feel free to type them in the chat pod. Looks like people are typing. Um, okay. Okay, there's a couple of questions. Oh. Uh, did we do Stephanie Daniels' uh, question yet? They all seem to be popping in at the same time. Stephanie Daniels wanted to know, can you explain more about the commuter certification? Can we explain more about the commuter certification? Did we answer that already, Brittany? We have not answered that. I, I don't think so. Okay. Somebody want to take that? Do we have any more information on the commuter certification? Uh, the Federal Register doesn't have detail about that. Yeah, so we'll just have to refer you to the, uh, the Federal Register notice. Who was it that asked that question? Stephanie. Daniel. Okay, Stephanie, we'll follow up with uh, a link for you on that question. Great. Um, after that, Brody wants to know if uh, will there be a uh, presentation for rural reporting changes? Do we have that scheduled? Yes, the presentation for rural reporting changes is coming up in September. I think it's September 18th. So less than two weeks. Actually, uh, Here's a good opportunity for a plug. If uh, anybody wants to see the upcoming webinars, they are listed on the NTI website, which is www.ntionline.com uh, forward slash webinars, and everything should be listed on there. So yes, September 18th, Tuesday. <coughs> um, Melissa Ash asked, paid absences. Does this include all paid absences, such as vacation, sick, jury duty, etc.? Yes. Okay. I just lost my spot here. My 
not my, this is technologically not in my day. Um, okay. <clears throat> Francisco Chavez uh, said, my agency is only three years old. Do we need to do an audit for the 2018 report? If you have not done one in the past three years, then yes. Yeah. So do we know if there are full or small systems? If you're a full reporter and you had done it in your first year reporting, you don't have to do it again. But if you're a small system and you've never done one, you will have to do it in the 2018 report year. Okay, the next question is from Barbara Creel. How is the IAS-FD audit different from the annual audits and annual OMB-133 audits we already do? Yeah, so the IAS-FD specifically looks at the NTD uniform system of accounts, which is not something that would be looked at for your single audit. Um, and it determines that your internal accounts have been correctly mapped to the chart of accounts in the USOA. Um, so that, that's its primary purpose, which is really a different purpose from the, the annual uh, single audit. Okay, the next question uh, is from Christopher Broach. Are updated templates for reduced reporters going to be made available? It was previously an Excel document. If that is for rural reporters, then yes, we will have a schedule of templates going out um, at the beginning of the, the report year, and we'll cover that in a little bit more detail for the rural reporting webinar. For all other reporter types, there aren't Excel templates. Um, however, there are now, uh, from the system, exportable uh, templates that um, come in Excel format. So we encourage all reporters to use utilize that functionality um, for almost every NTD form you will be able to export and re-import data into the reporting system <coughs> and you'll be able to export them as soon as you perform your kickoff to generate your annual form correct Uh, next up is Jane Lamaster. What is an example of a service vehicle you, as used in AE35? Um, that would be like manager vehicles, supervisory vehicles, tow trucks, transit police cars. That's another right. good one. Basically, any any um, non-revenue vehicle, uh, non-revenue rolling stock, essentially. Does not include golf carts and flatbed trains. Flatbed train. That's right. Um, and I think it's Hewitt. I'm not sure if that's correct. Sorry if it's not. When you mention new commuter service, is this service that is new to fiscal year 18? Uh, yes. So if, if you already reported it in the past, then we're not asking you to uh, do anything additional to continue reporting it. Next is from Suzanne Kalmbacher, maybe. To clarify, if service does not qualify as a commuter service, then all service is reported as non-UAZ? Uh, yeah, so if it's not local service, if it's intercity service, um, then you have to report it in the non-UCA. Next, from Don Erickson. Regarding the A-35 for the service vehicle inventory, we have several electric vehicles that are similar to golf carts. Just to clarify, we would not include them in reporting. Um, correct. If they're golf carts, they would not be reported. They have to be roadworthy vehicles. Tina Ignat uh, says, because we have many assets that predate our agency's existence and we don't have info on when they were built, what do we do? That's a good question. You would, you would need to use the, the best estimate in terms of guideway construction to, to group them into those buckets um, that you can give us. I'd recommend talking to your uh, assigned NTD reporting analyst. We are aware there are some 
uh, segments of track that are very old, uh, constructed in uh, the first half of the 20th century. So uh, please give your analysts a call on that, and we can work on getting the best data we have we can get into the system. Karen is asking for clarification on B-30. It sounded like the form would automatically calculate the split. Is that not how it works now? So in prior years, the agency would remove the fares and capital leasing and type in a net figure. And the form would still calculate the operating expense number that we would use. But going forward, we're just not asking the agencies to do that calculation to find the net. They would just type in the total contract or the total payment to the contractor, and the form will calculate the net figure itself that's used to calculate operating expenses. It's just tying it back to a number that the agencies are more familiar with. They can tie back a number for what they paid the contractor instead of trying to tie back a, a net number. Next is Francisco Chavez. Does it have to be performed by an independent auditor? Assuming the IAS. Yes, it should. Yes, yeah, independent auditor. Um, Norman S. asks, if an out-of-area MOM is buying a bus passed on, wait, mom. OK, I thought that was, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Wow, I, this is not a great day. OK, if an Adam area mom is buying bus passes online for her young adult child attending college, how do we count that fare? <laughs> so that, that's still a passenger paid fare. Um, a mom is not an organization. <laughs> Although I, I thought it was. <laughs> yeah. Not the MOM. Okay. <laughs> There's always, you know, codes and stuff. I did. Okay. That was... <laughs> um, Tina asks if you can explain what assets are included in train and signaling for the A20 form. Yeah. So on the A20 form, you'll indicate whether or not your agency has train control and signaling elements. Um, you don't have to include either the number or quantity. Um, so that would include things like um, positive train Hello? Uh-oh. Brittany? Hmm. I don't have my presenters in my ear anymore. <laughs> wow, this has been quite a day. Um, so I can wait and see if they reconnect. Maybe their phone got disconnected. I Unless I can't hear them. No one else is hearing anyone speak right now, right? It's just me, just Lori from NTI. I wonder what happened. Um, unfortunately, I can't answer these questions. <laughs> and um, I'm not sure. I don't know if they lost their connection. I don't know if. I, I honestly, I'm not sure. Maybe we should take a vote. Because I, I see there was a lot more questions. Um, okay, this is, okay, thank you, Boyd. Uh, well, just bear with me, everyone. I should have prepared some jokes or something, you know, to fill the time. I didn't realize. <laughs> This is going to be such a, uh... oh, here we are. Hello? Hi, Lori. Hi, Hi are you Mom. back? Oh, my goodness. Don't do that again. <laughs> it was stalling and stretching. I was going to start singing. It was going to be bad. I'm sorry. 
Um, <laughs> sorry, so that's the last question we had. All right, I'm trying to scroll back up because, um, okay, wait, where were we? I'm completely. I think, I think we were yeah. we were in the middle of answering the question about power. Yeah, for change control and signaling. So, yeah, just to uh, tie that one up. So, train control and signaling, some examples would be positive train control or um, some light signal, so it's basically any element that is used in signaling the train um, on track. So there's a, there's a lot of things that make up that category. Um, it can definitely vary between agencies, but those are just two examples of things that you would include. Um, I'm, I, complete, I scrolled all the way to the end of the chat, and I'm trying to find, oh, I think, was that question from Tina, I think? It was about the A20 form, right? Yes. yes. Okay, now we're up to Lee Combs. Under IAS-FFA independent auditor statement for federal funding allocation data, if you have PT, does the contract does the contractor provide an independent auditor statement for their data checklist? Um, ND manual, page 236. In, in most cases, the um, independent auditor would review both CO and PT modes, so there would be a single IAS FFA covering the entire report. Um, but agencies do have the option of um, having a separate IAS FFA for a purchase transportation mode. Okay. Um, next question from Jane. With a contracted operator, would we, the transit agency, be required to report paid absences, and what is a full reporter? Paid um, so a full oh, reporter so is a reporter type. Um, so you're either a I full reporter. I think they're asking about purchase transportation. Would be my guess. Right. So for, for, yeah, so for purchase transportation, uh, you do not split out the contractor's costs into salaries and fringe benefits and, and paid absences. Uh, the contractor's costs, the amount that you pay to the contractor, um, are just reported as purchase transportation expenses. Okay, next question is from Priscilla. Can you explain more on the A90 form and mileage? Oh, someone open up the chat box, hugely, oh. enormously. Sorry. <laughs> I guess that was us, just to, just to get. Um, so the question was uh, on the A90. Uh, asking us to elaborate about mileage. I'm not sure. Um, we might have to follow up with you directly to, to clarify. There's nothing pertaining to mileage uh, on the A20, I guess, other than track miles under performance restriction. Uh, that may be that may be the question. So you'll report track miles under performance restriction. And on the slide itself, we, uh, we sort of show the equation there. Track miles under performance restriction, the, uh, the numerator and the denominator will be all miles in revenue service for which your agency has capital response. Um, I'm having, okay. I think the next question was from Debbie Swickard. Our agency is a full reporter and we were told we needed to do an audit as this was our 10th year. We are currently in the process of our audit. Are you saying we don't need to do an audit? So if your last IASFD was 10 or more years ago, then you do need to do a new one this year. Okay, I just lost my... I shrunk the chat window again, and I completely lost where I was. Oh, that was Debbie's question. Okay. Uh, Rodaliza wants to know, how do we treat federal CNG fuel credits? Is it revenue or netted against fuel expenses? Please refer to the question of Daniel Benavidez above. Do we answer Daniel's question? Yeah, so it, it's the same yeah. response as we gave to Daniel. Uh, you'll report that as a revenue zone at that. Okay. Laronda's, uh, Laronda Sager's Irwin asks, 
Can you discuss the reporting for tax refunds specifically on how the alternative fuel tax credit is handled? I think, yeah, I think we've got the same question. Okay. So we we answered that already? Okay. Right. Daniel Benavidez, is there a guide uh, of best practices for mapping our chart of accounts to the USOA, one that reduces the reliance on spreadsheets for allocations associated with Form F30? So if you're talking about you know, software solutions, we don't uh, endorse any particular um, method. Um, the USOA contains a lot of information that should help you do the actual accounting work of figuring out which of how your your accounts, your charter of accounts match to the USOA. Um, so not sure we can give a lot more detail about that, but if you want to contact your analyst with specific questions, I'm sure he or she would be happy to, to help you as much as possible. Thanks, Matt. Um, Chona Medell, sorry if I'm butchering that. How do I know if we submitted an IAS FD audit? I was employed at with the agency at the start. Uh, your analyst should be able to answer that question for you. Uh, Tavares Price says, I asked earlier about paratransit facilities and transit asset management facilities inventory. At least I think that's what this stands for. Do we report them if we contract out the services? So if you have any passenger stations or passenger facilities that are used for your paratransit services, um, even if your agency does not have capital responsibility for them, so for example, if they're owned by your contractors, you would include those on the A15 form. If there are any administrative or maintenance facilities um, that your agency does not have capital responsibility for, so an example would be a maintenance facility that's owned by your contractor, those would not be included on the A15 form. Um, I guess Chona, Chana, from the question earlier, says they were not employed with the agency. I don't know if that changes the response. You would still ask the um, same person, or yeah, if that's regarding whether or not you've submitted an ISFD before, uh, your analyst can help you look that up. Okay. Uh, the the Franklin Transit Group, uh, if two reporters share administration and fleet facilities, does each agency report on the A15 or would that be seen as a duplication? So on the A15 form, there's a functionality to add a shared facility. So once one agency adds that, the other would be able to look up that facility by name or by zip code to add that same instance of that facility to their A15 form to avoid duplicates. Jim Peplo, on breaking out the fares paid by passengers or organizations, if any agency buys passes to hand out to clients, they are to be broken into different a different area than if an individual walked into our office to buy a pass for themselves, correct? Yeah, that's right. Sorry, I was just <clears throat> reading the question. Um, yeah. So if an organization is buying the pass, then that's an organization paid fare. Um, if the rider is uh, buying the pass, then that's a passenger paid fare. Great. Sean Sosa says, in the NTI training in April, uh, I made a note regarding the IAS, wait, my cursor's in the way, FD. Uh, that the new requirement of having the accounting software audited every 10 years is starting in 1819. Uh, so it was under the thought that a new review would need to be reported with the 1819's report, October 2019. I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know yeah, what I just read. <laughs> the, the question is, does the requirement start with fiscal year 2018 to fiscal year 2019? Uh, and the policy has always been fiscal year 2018. I'm not sure where that information came from but given the miscommunication, I think the case recommends 
reach out to your client and see and check the book to make them aware um, and we can discuss the solution. Um, is that Matt? You're you're breaking up. Sorry, I, I was saying uh, contact your, your NTD analyst on this one. Uh, the requirement has always been fiscal year 2018. It sounds like there was a miscommunication. Okay. Satyan Patel says, on the A20 form, do you use the other description field to actually state what the asset is? So on the A20 form, there is a section for other if you share a element with another agency. There's also a notes section where you can include any information about any of the particular elements that you find necessary. Um, it is an optional section, but please feel free to include any information about those elements that you'd like to um, submit with a report. Okay, this is the part in the questions where the phone dropped out and I was rambling. So, let me see. Okay, then, uh, Sachin says again, on the A20, if you want to report a quantity, the count column E is grayed out as well as you cannot change the quote allocation unit to quantity. How do you report quantity? Because the presenter indicated you could choose the unit. So I believe this is referring to the power and signal um, section of the A20 form. So we only collect quantity for substations. So that is why quantity is grayed out for the uh, remainder of the power and signal elements. For the remaining elements, such as third rail or overhead um, systems, you are just simply indicating whether or not your agency has those elements for that particular mode. And that's why for the construction section, um, you cannot change the allocation unit for those last four elements. It's only um, listed as a percentage. So for substation, you can report by quantity or percentage in the construction section. But that's, I believe you're referring to the template for the A20. Um, so I'd recommend taking a look in the reporting system. It may make it a little bit more clear what we're looking for for each element. Uh, next from Tina, our PTC is installed but not in revenue service. Do we have to report that under train control and signaling? No, so you would not report that element until it is used in revenue service. Jane LeMaster, sorry, uh, wait, oh, did, you guys, did I lose you guys again? I heard a beep. We can hear you, can you hear us? Oh, yeah, I don't know what, <sighs> I am not buying a lottery ticket today. My luck is not. <laughs> um, wait, I think Jane was referencing her question that was earlier. Um, oh my goodness, there's so many questions here. Um, Jonathan Weaver says, what is the FTA's definition of a scheduled revenue trip? Uh, I think we would need more context to answer that question. Okay, uh, if, John, if Jonathan's still there, maybe he can, uh, you know, reach out. Francisco, Francisco Chavez says, can an agency delay the audit until next year? Well, the, the requirement is for 2018. Um, if you don't think that you'll be able to meet that requirement, then you should contact your analyst and uh, we'll go from there. Suzanne wants to know if she can print out these questions and answers. Um, Suzanne, send me an email at lglickman, L-G-L-I-C-K-M-A-N, at nti.rutgers.edu, and I will see if I can um, get you the portion of the transcript that deals with the questions and answers but I probably won't remember after the afternoon I'm having. So please send me an email. Uh, Tavares Price says, oh, never mind. They were just giving me more comments rather than questions. Uh, Francisco wants a link to the presentation. Uh, the links are in the notes section. Those are the handouts. I don't usually hand out the PowerPoints. I'm not sure how uh, you all feel about that. I mean, if, if you're okay, I can send out the PowerPoint, but I usually just send out the handouts. Um, FCA will also post a link um, to this, this handout. 
Okay. Uh, Leslie Pedrosa, if employers buy passes for employees, does that get reported under passenger fare? Uh, that would be an organization paid fare. Okay. Barbara Creel, can the independent auditor who is conducting our annual audit also do the IAS-FT audit, or since they are already doing an audit for us, we need to procure a separate independent auditor for that service? Uh, the same auditor, same auditing firm can do both. I think we already touched on the definition of full reporters versus other types of reporters, but I don't know if you have anything you want to add. I think we actually skipped over that. That was a question oh. in one of the earlier ones that didn't get answered. Oh. Um, so a, a full reporter um, is just the largest of our reporting uh, types. You would be a full reporter if you have fixed guideway or if you operate more than 30 vehicles in maximum service. Um, those are the requirements to be a full reporter. If you don't meet either of those two requirements, you have the option to be a reduced reporter, which is just um, a smaller version of the report with fewer reporting requirements. Uh, full reporters have the monthly ridership reports that they submit as well as monthly safety and security reports, whereas reduced reporters do not. Okay, hope that clears it up. Uh, Jonathan Weaver says, so is a scheduled revenue trip from terminus to terminus or the all-day route of the bus is given at the beginning? Is a scheduled revenue trip from terminus to terminus or the all-day route the bus is given at the beginning of its day? So scheduled revenue trips are not a data point that we collect. Um, so I, I'm still not sure what the context of the question is. Is it a reference to mechanical failures? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, what was the question again? So if the, basically, if the vehicle was supposed to go back out and they do not, then that would be them not completing their next scheduled revenue trip. That's right. It's not the entirety of the, the route that is tied to yeah. Hopefully that okay. answers, but if it, if it doesn't, please let us know in the chat. Yeah. Um, Melissa uh, Rossi says, there's a save button for the transcript, which is true and it's awesome, but um, two of the computers in my office weren't even seeing the transcript at all. So if, if you are in that situation and you need a copy of the transcript, send me an email. Um, Simone Reed says, does the auditor report cover the dollars or just the process we use? Yeah, so the IASFD focuses on processes, um, not on the uh, numbers or dollars from a particular year. Um, so the auditor may look at the dollars from the year when they're examining the books, um, but that's not really what they're trying to certify. They're trying to certify that the process you have in place is uh, sufficient. Jim had a follow-up to his earlier question um, about organization pur purchase passes. He wants to know, if, uh, do we need to differentiate between agencies that pay full price versus those that have some type of discount agreement, either in buying the passes or billed per ride at a discounted fare? Uh, no, you don't need to make that distinction. Uh, Stephanie Daniel says, where would you report our full reporter agency reduces, reimburses a reduced reporter for our passengers, university students, rides? Yeah, this seems sort of involved. I would recommend you reach out to your analyst and we can get some more details and, uh, and help you out. Susan Mosley says, is APC validation sampling required each year? Uh, no, the APC certification is required every third year. Um, so starting in the year when you implement the APCs, and then all agencies are on the same three-year cycle. So all agencies with APCs will have to recertify in 2019. That's fiscal 2019. And again, in fiscal 2022, 2025, and so on. 
Um, Jonathan Weaver has two questions. I think the first part was referencing the question that was earlier. Um, but the second part says, if the bus makes it to the end of the line, then it is not counted as a major mechanical failure. If the bus does not make it to the end of the line, then it is a major mechanical failure. So the question is just basically whether you have to replace the bus. If you have to bring out a replacement vehicle to complete the service that that bus was supposed to be um, operating, then that's a mechanical failure. So I, I think you're focusing too much on uh, the word revenue trip. It's really just about whether you have to swap out a bus or not. OK. Ooh, I think that was the uh, last. Oh, someone's typing. Colleen Hansen, uh, what if an employer buys passes, but their employees pay a portion? Uh, I think this is another one where we're getting into the weeds, so I would recommend you contact your analyst and uh, we'll have a discussion. Okay. I see people are typing. We'll just wait a minute to... Oh, thank you, Susan. That's the link to the handouts. Uh, Stephanie Daniels, what if the bus swap out is due to a traffic collision. Yeah, so that's the, the clarification that we issued this year, which is that you only report mechanical failures that are um, caused by, a, like it says, a, a mechanical failure of the bus. So if it's due to a traffic collision or due to a natural disaster, um, you do not report that as a mechanical failure. Um, part, uh, Parker Martin. For example, if we add a route within 90-minute one-way trip times, do we need to conduct the annual 50% round-trip study? Um, probably not, uh, because it sounds like you're talking about a, a commuter bus mode that was already being reported. Um, but I would recommend you contact your analyst just uh, to make sure that we have all the details. All right, last call for questions, everyone who's still there. Anybody? Uh, multiple attendees are typing. Um, Matt, Brittany, do you? I want to say anything in closing if there are no more questions coming in, or are you good? <laughs> I think we're fine. I just want to thank everybody for taking the time to dial in and, and listen to the webinar. Oh, Susan had one more question. If a system fails, it does not prevent the rail vehicle from operating, such as the AC at the maintenance facility, that would not be reported? So that would be an other mechanical failure? as opposed to a major mechanical failure. So you, you do report it, but it's a different category. OK. Um, I guess that's it. Parting words? Do my wrap up? <laughs> um, nope. And as, as you guys sit back and, and think about and digest the, uh, the webinar, if you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to your, to your agency analyst or, or Brittany and myself. And we'd be more than happy to, to get you the answers you, you need. Great. Thank you. Um, I want to thank everyone for participating. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Uh, I did my best to work around them and fix them, and these things happen. So appreciate your understanding. Um, a special thank you to Brittany and Matt for your informative presentation. As a reminder, you will be receiving an invitation to fill out an evaluation for this event. NTI greatly appreciates your feedback. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon.